not so up now. I don't remember that. It's not right now. That would not have been possible. Yeah, that's what our sign shows. Yeah, but I think they're actually part of it. They're actually part They're not on the map. They're like. Itty bitty. I don't remember. It's not on the map. Tell us about it. I drove through it. It's real shit. Well, you have to sign the very first time I went there. You pass the sign. I thought you were going to like drop in here. But if you pass the sign, like you're. Yeah, but who does that? Unless you live there. Yeah, but you can do that. Yeah, she sent me that yesterday. She's like, shut off your warning. It's still recording. Uh, it's a delicate play. Oh, sure. Maybe we should stop it. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so uh, we're working our way um, off the head down into the neck area. And uh, we'll work on, uh, at first we'll work on the muscles that are attached uh, to the mandible and the hyoid uh, and the thyroid cartilage and the sternum. And we'll just slowly work our way down on the anterior portion of the neck, and we'll stop the level of the manubrium and the clavicle. We'll go around the back side and pick up the trapezius and the muscles deep to the trapezius. And then we'll flip back around to the front side again as we work our way down. But as we go, I'm going to be using a lot of innervation terminology. And at the last, uh, during the last portion of the class on Friday, I had uh, given you some information you had before. And I had added to that <coughs> Um, some language that I need to use as we talk about the cervical plexus. So just very briefly by way of review, um, we pointed out in the anatomy of the spinal nerves that you think they're coming off, um, you think they're coming off like the spinal nerve goes to a root, it goes to the cord. And that's true. But if you look at where the roots attach to the cords, you can see that there are um, rootlets attaching to the spinal cord that connect to each of these roots. Both sensory and motor information pass through um, the spinal nerves, but you remember that split to the spinal cord. We get dorsal, uh, sensory stuff, and ventral motor. And then I described to you the anatomy of the end of the spinal cord, uh, indicating to you that the vertebral column outpaces the growth rate of the cord, and so whenever we're, um, as our height is being achieved, the cord doesn't reach the bottom of the spinal cord, and so it ends at L2, and so the roots that you find coming off of the lower portions of the spinal cord, in fact, as you work your way down the spinal cord, the roots get longer and longer, and those roots down the lumbar and sacral regions have to extend downward in the vertebral canal to, to, to reach their exit points. And so it looks like a horse's tail if you dissect the cauda equina. And then um, we talked about the, um, the branches of each of the spinal nerves. Um, as we come off of the cord, listen carefully, as we come off of the cord, we call those roots. Now, Unfortunately, and again, I didn't make this up. My job to point these things out to try to help you remember them. Unfortunately, whenever we get to the brachial plexus, the term for root is also going to refer to the ventral rami. So I'm sorry, um, that's the case. For now, I'll point that out again, but for now you can see that um, the roots are dorsal sensory and ventral motor. Then they come together to form a spinal nerve, and then immediately, almost immediately after they form the nerve, they give rise to branches themselves. A dorsal ramus, small dorsal ramus, and remember we said that those dorsal rami follow a simple segmental pattern. We're not going to see them until we get to the splenius. So the deep muscles of the back, that's where, we're, that's where those dorsal rami will show up. Until that time, we're really going to be talking about just the ventral rami, so the ventral rami of the spinal uh, nerve, and then the meningeal rami I drew on the board, but that's the last I'm going to talk about. Them. Now, um, uh, two things here before I go back to the neck and we work our way down uh, the neck muscles uh, sequentially and methodically. Whenever we talk about the innervations of muscles that move you, 
So you're thinking about the, the spinal nerves that come off of the cervical and lumbar enlargements, these places where a lot of information is coming off the spinal cord to supply the upper and lower extremities. Whenever you think about the spinal nerves that control your movement, you should think about the ventral rami. I'll say it that way on purpose because all of the plexus information, the, the multiple spinal cord segments that feed spinal nerves, that safety net that I talked about last time, that is all part of what we, um, that is all part anatomically of the ventral branches of the spinal nerves. The dorsal rami are going to come off in a segmental, simple segmental pattern. The complication of innervation for muscles is the cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral plexus. That's where the nasty is. All of those nerves in those plexuses are ventral rami. So we'll see all this language of C2 to C3 and C3 to C5 and T1. Um, and then we get down to lumbar and L2 to L4 and all that multiple segment stuff that we see in the plexus. All ventral rami, all of it. Now, in the same way the dorsal rami come off in these simple segmental patterns, the ventral rami do also through the thoracic regions. So basically, the nerves that go to the muscles between your ribs, the intercostal muscles, follow a simple segmental pattern. So really, you've got three scenarios here. One scenario is the dorsal rami, which are really going to the deep muscles of the back. And you can predict where on the muscle the innervation comes from. You don't need to memorize that. If you're at the level of um, T2 or T5, or, or uh, sorry, further up in the cervical region, C4, C5, um, like for the splenius, then you know it's coming off one spot on the spinal cord to go to that deep muscle of the back. The same thing is true for the intercostal muscles between the ribs. So between T2 and T12, there is no plexus. The plexus is up in the neck down in the back. It is not through the thoracic regions. Through those thoracic regions we find the ventral rami supply the intercostal muscles by way of nerves that come off in a simple segmental pattern. So three scenarios. Simple segmental patterns from dorsal rami to deep back muscles. Simple segmental patterns from ventral rami to the intercostal muscles. The rest of it is nasty. Plexus multiple spinal cord segments going to individual muscles. So we'll take our time as we go through those. All right, so that's an introduction once again to those. Now let's work our way down. I've got this key with this, this slender slanted arrow and the uh, thicker arrow here. And let me tell you how I'm thinking. This will help you as you're studying, I think, how I'm thinking about doing this. I want to work my way down from the top down. So you'll notice that these two slanted arrows have C1 by 12. C1 by 12. Muscle's name for their attachment, so you just need to tag the muscle to the innervation because you won't miss where it's attached. The genio, remember we saw um, the um, we saw the geniothyroid, no, we saw the genioglossus before attached to the tongue, and the mandible. Uh, near the mandibular synthesis. And I showed you that picture, it gets 12 right off the hypoglossal, through the hypoglossal canal. This one, the geniohyoid, also has, as you can see here, has attachment near the mandibular synthesis, but this one goes to the hyoid bone. So this is way up there, right? I'm working my way down, this is way high. Geniohyoid, this one gets C1 by 12. Now, from what you've learned from me so far, this is another reason why I bring up the lacrimal innervation right here. From what you've learned from me so far, what do you, how do you interpret this language, C1 by 12? 
how can that be? Shouldn't I have to choose? How can it be see? How can I get information to this muscle from the first spinal cord segment using the hypoglossal nerve? We learn the hypoglossal nerve and the three big muscles that are attached to the tongue, right? Before. What's up with this? Well, certainly I'm lower than the tongue, right? <clears throat> See if this picture helps you. We're going to do a lot on this picture in just a moment. <coughs> Here's C1. And do you see the label here? This is ex an extension of the 12th cranial nerve. So very similar to that scenario where we saw cranial nerves 5 and 7 joining forces. And then the fibers, the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers traveling along 5 out to the lacrimal gland. They're sharing pathways here. And so we would call this a C1 ventral ramus, but it's also the hypoglossal nerve. So <clears throat> that's what that means. Now look at me like I'm crazy. The genial hyaluronic is C1 by 12, as is the thyrohyoid. Now, where is this muscle? The thyrohyoid. <clears throat> Thyro and all these muscles here in the neck. Thyro refers to the thyroid cartilage of the voice box. So it's a high muscle. Genio hyoid from there to there. Thyroid hyoid from here to here. These are high muscles in the neck. They're way up there. They get C1 by 12. Now, the other muscles that are shown here that I'd like for you to learn are the muscles that are innervated by the ansa cervicalis. I mentioned this one time, this is the second time, but now it's time to learn what this is. Okay, if you look at the cervical plexus, you can see here that um, C1, as I say here, becomes off between the atlas and the occipital condyle. Y'all know where I am, right at the top. This is between C1 and the occipital bone. And there's C2, and there's C3, and C4, and C5, and this labels those roots. Okay? So it's labeled root. Now, if I say root, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Ventral root becoming spinal nerve. Yes? Okay, so that works here. You can think of this, it doesn't show the cord, but you can think of this as a ventral root coming spinal cord because you can see some branches coming off here immediately. Um, so there's a segmental branch coming off right there. Now, the second part of this, very important to see this and the anatomy of this. It's okay, it's okay right now to think of this as root. We'll get to the brachial plexus, that's going to get worse. Okay, It's okay here to see this in your mind as the ventral root. That's the motor part. Okay, but if you need to add something to this, this picture does not have, this, the image of this picture here does not have the dorsal ramus. It does not have the meningeal branch. It does not have the rami communicating branches. This picture is of the ventral rami. Okay, so all of this stuff is ventral rami branches of these spinal uh, segments, C1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, notice that as C1, as the ventral ramus of C1 comes off, it is joined by the ventral ramus of C2, and it is joined by the ventral ramus of C3. But what I'm showing you here is the first three ventral rami are all linked together. The first three ventral rami are all linked together in a plexus scenario that we call the ansa cervicalis. So the ansa cervicalis, it certainly has a posterior and anterior root, and I don't care about that um, for you guys. It's good enough here for, you, for me, if you can see, that you get C1, C2, and C3 all together. So when you see something like ansa cervicalis here, immediately you should think C1, C2, C3. That is the ansa cervicalis. 
it is the joining of those three spinal ventral rami, those three spinal cord segments, the ventral rami of them. So when we look at a muscle like the omohyoid attached to the scapula and the hyoid, look, I'm moving down. I had geniohyoid, thyrohyoid. Now I've, now I've taken one from the hyoid bone all the way down to the scapula. I'm getting further down. So instead of C1 by 12 now, I'm getting C1, C2, C3. And that should make sense to you now. Of course, if you get C1, what do I think immediately? He gets C2 and C3 also. How would you know that? Because they're all joined together. That's the point, the ansa cervicalis. When I say ansa cervicalis, you should immediately think C1 to C3. So the omohyoid, the sternohyoid, and the sternothyroid all get ansa cervicalis innervation. We're moving down the anterior portion of the neck. Name for where they attach, scapula hyoid. This is attached to the manubrium, right? The sternum, y'all found this one in the lab. The sternohyoid and the sternothyroid. This one's lower. We're getting lower and lower from the manubrium here up to the hyoid, uh, sorry, up to the thyroid cartilage of the voice box. Omohyoid, if you say them over and over again, it begins to help. And I've got it on the next picture too. Omohyoid, sternohyoid, sternothyroid. Omohyoid, sternohyoid, sternothyroid. And so when I flip over here, omohyoid, sternohyoid, and what's the next one? Sternothyroid. Omohyoid, sternohyoid, sternothyroid. Omohyoid, sternohyoid, sternothyroid. This is the innervation of the ansa cervicalis to the muscles on the ventral side, mostly ventral. Um, the omohyoid does go to the scapula. But this is not moving down the neck, is the point. So these three major muscle groups here and their innervation. Now, two more things here. First, each of these uh, spinal nerves, each of the spinal nerves that come off of these segments of the spinal cord has a segmental branch. It is normally considered the primary nerve. It's not part of the ansa cervicalis. It's considered part of the primary nerve that comes off here. Notice there's no plexus here connecting the segmental branches. And there's a reason why we use the word segmental. When I say segmental, what do you think? Yeah, that's the way the dorsal ray might do it. That's the way T2 to T12 does it on the ventral side. And so when I say the segmental branches of 1 to 5 innervate these muscles, then you don't need to memorize whether it's C1 or C4. Why not? Because you would know from where you are on the muscle. You could predict where that would be. And I, I certainly, I mean, how would I ask that? I don't know how to ask that question. So the levator uh, scapula, which you haven't seen yet, just tuck these away because I'm going to add to these as I go. The trapezius, the sternocleidomastoid, which we're going to see in just a moment, the scalenes on the first two ribs and transverse processes, and the geniohyoid and the thyrohyoid. These also get segmental branches. So um, the hyoid names start to circulate in your head now um, as you're looking at these. Um, so they're on the other pictures as well. So uh, go back and forth with these for me for the segmental branches. This, frankly, this piece right here, if you want to at this point, you can just mark through that because there's no memorization to be done here. We're going to go to each one of these muscles and talk about the innervation. I just use it to say, look, the ventral ramus is not the only story here. You are getting some ventral root projections into these nerves in a segmental pattern. All right? So I can say that again. Now, here's the last one, the last piece of this. As it turns out, whenever you learn the innervations of the muscles, as we go through this, all the way through this class, as you learn, the spinal cord segments that innervate various muscles, you will be by default learning their sensory innervations as well. Now, this one I'm going to talk about in just a moment, but I won't do this with the rest of them. This is a picture of the dermatome right here. A dermatome is a, an area 
a superficial area of skin and the spinal cord segment that would receive the sensory information from it. So this is touch me, where does the information go? So <clears throat> when you look up here and you see C2 and C3 and C4 and C5 and C2 and C3 and you can see we're going to split these things up, lumbar and sacral plexus, we talk about sciatica, we talk about all the innervations on the back of the arm and the front of the arm. This is a picture of where in the spinal cord the sensory information would go. But you don't need to memorize this because as we go, you will learn this by default. Except for, except for the four major sensory pieces of the cervical plexus. Those you have to learn from me. So here they are. They are, one, first, the lesser occipital nerve that receives uh, or delivers information to spinal segments two and three. Now, you have your little tricks, uh, y'all how to do it. A minute ago I was doing this. Omo, highly, sternal, highly, sternal, thyroid. That's how I remember it. Okay, you say it over and over again. LR6, SO4, 3. Omo, highly, sternal, highly, sternal, thyroid. All right, here's, here's the way I remember this. There are four nerves, four major sensory pieces of the cervical plexus, and it's 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 3, 4. 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 3, 4. This is the way I remember them. So the first three, the lesser occipital is 2, 3. The greater auricular is 2, 3. The transverse cervical is 2, 3. And the supraclavicular is 3, 4. So all you got to do is learn their names. Okay, so think about it. The lesser occipital, the lesser occipital nerve, where is that? Lesser, yeah, right? So if I look at this dermatome, there it is right there. C2, C3, the lesser occipital. Here's the next one. The greater auricular, where is that one? Same place. Basically the same place, but where have I gone now from the lesser occipital? The ear. I moved around toward the ears, right. So now, C2, C3, off over here, right? The greater lesser occipital, greater auricular. The next one is the transverse cervical. The transverse cervical. Where's the cervical brain to the facial nerve? This neck. In the neck, yeah. So when I say cervical, you think neck. Okay, so this one also is 2 3 here, transverse cervical. So once again, lesser occipital, greater auricular, and then right here in the neck, right? I'm not to 4 yet. I'm getting transverse cervical, lesser occipital, greater auricular, transverse cervical. And then the last one, I'll show it to you here, three and four, this is getting lower in the neck. This one is called the supraclavicular nerve. Now, the supraclavicular should also tip you off here. If I've got greater occipital, uh, lesser occipital, greater auricular, transverse cervical, then whenever I talk about the clavicular, I'm doing this, yeah? When I go to the supraclavicular, I'm doing this way. And so as I move this way, I'm also moving down. So two, three, two, three, two, three, three, four. The cervical, the, the branches of the cervical plexus that are superficial, um, carrying, helping to carry such information from these dermatomes. All right, so that's the last time I'm going to do dermatomes with you. All right. Now, uh, last thing to say about the cervical plexus, and I'll leave it. This one uh, doesn't have any neck information in it, but it's interesting, and you've got you got to know this. Okay, this is in fact the Merib text makes this the major point of the cervical plexus. It is the nerve that comes off of C3 to C5. C3, C4, C5, ventral rami all come together to form a nerve called the phrenic nerve that goes to your diaphragm. So if you have a spinal cord injury, right? So I'm going to talk about this again in just a moment. So if the dens of the axis comes out of the fovea dentis of the atlas during a whiplash in action of your neck, the dens is on the anterior side of the cord, right? If it protrudes into the anterior side there of the spinal cord and brain stem, 
what will it impact? What is on the ventral side? The motor stuff, yeah. And so this is deadly. This is why we have headrests or car seats to prevent this from happening. So that dens does not do that. So if something catches your neck before it jerks that dens out of that thing. Because if it hits the ventral side and it prevents information from your brain stem from getting to C3, what's going to happen? Okay. You're not going to breathe. You will not breathe. If there's not a ventilator available immediately within moments, that's it for you. So you will stop breathing at that point. So the critical place for breathing, the critical spinal cord place for delivering information for breathing is C3 to C5. Any spinal cord injury above C3 is deadly for this reason. Because you will not breathe without information from your brain getting to C3 to C5. That's the critical error. All right. Now, <clears throat> let's work through the neck then. Um, one muscle you've already found in the lab is the sternocleidomastoid. Now look, um, we're just going to work our way around, y'all. We did all these muscles attached up here to the mandible and to the hyoid and to the thyroid cartilage. We even got one attached all the way to the scapula. And so we've done all these anterior neck muscles in their innervation. So now we're going to just uh, move our way out a little bit lateral and then go around the back side of the neck. So this one is the easiest one to find, the sternocleidomastoid. And it is attached, the sternocleidomastoid is attached to the manubrium clavicle and mastoid process. Y'all knew that already. The manubrium, the clavicle, and the mastoid process. And again, it's innervation from cranial nerve 11 and C2 to C3. Anything new here? Uh, it was a rhetorical question. There is something new here. So if I say it's getting C2 to C3, what do you think? We're not talking about sensory stuff here. We're not talking about one of those three major superficial nerves here. If I'm two and three, if I'm getting information from two and three, where did it come from? It's not the answer cervicalis, right? Because that's C1 to C3. So where is it coming from, Brandon? The dermatome. No, the dermatome is the sensory stuff. The segmental branches, that's right, that's why I mentioned this. This is just segmental branches, two and three, go out to this nerve. What about this one? Have we talked about 11 carrying any kind of information to muscles yet? Uh-uh. What hole in the skull does 11 go through? This is the accessory nerve. The glossopharyngeal, the vagus, and the accessory all pass through a large hole the foramen, in the no, through the jugular foramen. That's right. Now, I need to add something to that for you. So here they are. This is 9, 10, and 11. All uh, 9, 10, and 11 all passing through the jugular foramen here. But here's something special about 11 that you didn't know yet. I'm adding to your cranial nerve information. All right? So here it is. Let's add to it. Cranial nerve 11 comes off of the brain stem and the spinal cord. Cranial nerve 11 comes off the brain stem and the spinal cord. Notice that it has two roots. It has a cranial root and it has a spinal root. Now, any anatomist teaching you anatomy is going to tell you that the cranial root of cranial nerve 11 is basically irrelevant. In, some, in, in, in fact, some textbooks will call the cranial root of 11 part of the vagus. So, for Wade Warren in this class, I do not care about the cranial root of cranial nerve 11. I do care about, however, the spinal root. And you can see here that the spinal root of cranial nerve 11 does receive information from all five segments of the spinal cord. Now, this is a good anatomy tip for how to identify cranial nerves on a brain dissection. If you look at a brain and a brain stem in a, dissect, in a dissection, how will you identify the 11th cranial nerve? It's connected. It will be connected to what? To the spinal cord. How many segments of cord? 
the top five cervical segments all connected to this nerve. Now, if this spinal nerve is connected to all five cervical segments and it's headed into the brain, what hole does it pass through? With the spinal cord. The foramen magna. Then it joins its cranial root, supposedly, and the two of them then form cranial nerve 11. And then how does it get back out of the brain? Jugular. Through the jugular foramen. That's right. This is a bizarre kind of um, thinking scenario here, um, how this thing comes out. You would think, well, okay, we'll just use this information in the cord to go to these. That's not what happens. It comes, the information comes out, go, sorry, the information comes here off the cord, goes up through the frame of magnum, joins the cranial root, and then passes down here as cranial nerve 11 to supply the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. So you can see cranial nerve 11 is involved in the control of neck muscles. And so when you see this picture here and it says 11 and C2 to C3, you go spinal root. Spinal root. That's where the C2, C3 came from by 11 in the sternocleidomastoid. All right. The other muscle here on the anterior side of the neck are the scalenes. You have to find these in the lab, don't, don't you? Yeah. So you just found the scalenes last Thursday. There are three sets here, anterior, middle, and posterior scalenes. And they attach to the transverse processes of the cervical bones. So we're going to see some others here. If you keep this list going. The transverse processes of the cervical bones. We're going to distinguish this. I'm going to do this for you over and over and just pound away at it. These are transverse processes. These are attached to the transverse processes of the cervical bones. And then they attach to the first two ribs. If the scalenes contract, what happens? The head moves. What? The head moves up and down. It's not attached to your head. It's attached to the transverse processes of the cervical bones. Turn side to side? No. Yeah, it's not shrugging your shoulders. It's not on the scapula. These muscles pull the rib cage this way, what are they used for? Breathing. breathing. Breathing, yeah. Scalenes are breathing muscles. Yeah, they're attached to the first two ribs. They elevate, they increase the thoracic volume so that you can inspire. Now, they're not the primary breathing muscles, but they're involved. The scalenes, anterior, middle, and posterior. And they get cervical nerve innervation. Look, I'm going to do this a lot as we go through this because the numbers are going to start getting crazy quickly on you. So I don't care what the numbers are. When I put this, I don't care. But you will have enough numbers to remember. All right. So we did this. Now, let's turn around to the back and do the trapezius. The trapezius muscle on the back and the cat, you learned, has three pieces. Clavo trapezius. Spino and chromio. In humans, it's just one big muscle in the back, this huge muscle. It is attached up here to the occipital bone. So you can see up here, it's attached to the external occipital protuberance and the superior.